On Friday, the FDA issued an emergency use authorization for the drug remdesivir. The medication is thought to be effective in speeding up recovery in coronavirus patients. But one thing it is not is a cure. Earlier, I spoke to an infectious disease expert about why that matters and how significant the discovery of remdesivir really is. Dr. Stephen Perotti joins us now. He's a national infectious disease lead for Kaiser Permanente. Dr. Perotti, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. You know, last week during a press conference, Dr. Anthony Fauci talked about remdesivir, which is, of course, an antiviral drug that's showing some promise in dealing with COVID-19. He compared remdesivir to what AZT was for the AIDS epidemic back in 1986. And here's what he had to say. When I was looking at this data with our team the other night, it was reminiscent of 34 years ago in 1986 when we were struggling for drugs for HIV. And we had nothing. And there was a lot of anecdotal reports about things that maybe did work, maybe not. People were taking different kinds of drugs. And we did the first randomized placebo-controlled trial with AZT, which turned out to give an effect that was modest. But that was not the end game, because building on that every year after, we did better and better. This will be the standard of care. Can you take us back that AZT discovery for AIDS? How does it compare? I understand HIV, AIDS, and coronavirus are two totally different viruses, but how does that discovery compare to where we are right now with remdesivir? I think that the initial results with remdesivir give us hope. Hope that we can find different targets on this virus uh, to develop drugs that will either reduce the effects of this virus um, or hopefully prevent severe disease. Um, and remdesivir, at least the initial uh, couple of trials have been conflicting, but uh, at least one has shown some hope. Um, and so what it does is it spurs us to look for other drugs, other discoveries. Um, it also gives us hope from the vaccine development standpoint that science can actually go after and attack this virus. Um, and I can tell you the other thing that's really important that Dr. Fauci referenced is the need to do the randomized control clinical trials, um, to actually take the time to develop the science so that we're effective um, and not just uh, working off of anecdotes. You know, speaking of HIV and AIDS, in Spain, it was fascinating. They're looking into a study right now of HIV patients, you know, people who have AIDS in particular, have some for some reason shown a lower risk of infection than the general population. And one of the things they're looking at is could the drugs they're taking maybe perhaps be effective? Can you talk to us a little bit about what we're seeing with that? Yeah, and so you know what these, um, these initial sort of studies have looked at is um, there are particular medications that we use to treat HIV patients. And so there have been some signals that potentially some of those virus, some of those medications actually target the virus itself. Um, now there have been conflicting studies here too. Um, so in China, where they've tested one particular HIV drug, they showed no effect. So it goes back to that initial principle that we can find the early signals, but then we need to follow up with the actual clinical trials to understand it fully. When many people talk about social distancing and quarantine, I don't think they realize that a lot of this is done not just to prevent them and their family members from getting this, but it's also to take the pressure off hospitals. Is flattening the curve working? And at what point does this idea of flattening the curve not work? So there is no question that the social distancing measures have been quite effective. So I can tell you that um, within our system, we have seen a dramatic reduction in the number of people that were coming into our emergency departments and hospitals. Um, and so we've been actually able to manage this outbreak in the context of just using our regular hospital beds, um, not even using surge beds. That being said, it's provided the entire US healthcare system some time to get ready for a potential surge. Um, so when we do reopen, and we can reopen responsibly, um, what we're going to be able to do is handle any number of new or increased cases within the existing infrastructure. And that's going to be important because that saves lives. We keep hearing a lot about a second wave. Everyone's saying that it is definitely coming this fall and we should brace for it. Why are people so worried about this intersecting with flu season? And what are you most concerned about with the second wave? 
So every year we have um, an epidemic and it's actually the flu season. Um, so we always see more cases uh, come into our emergency departments and into our hospital system. So we just know that as a given. The concern now is that we're gonna have COVID on top of that. Um, and so there's no question that we have to remain ready for what we call a surge. Um, because I think our concern is that we're gonna see more cases on top of what is already normally a busy winter season. And how long do you think we'll be in this period where we're social distancing? I think we're actually going into a new normal. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that we are not going to see a, a vaccine in full uh, use for at least 12 to 18 months. Um, and we don't have herd immunity based on the studies that we've done. So we're gonna need to do things differently. Um, we know that we can't keep things the way they are now, um, but the new normal will involve the symptom checks, the use of masks, the use of social distancing, um, and, and all of us actually pitching in together to protect the most vulnerable in our population. Dr. Purdy, you are an infectious disease specialist. What do you believe needs to happen before we can really reopen the country? So what is so important um, is that all of us who have sacrificed um, to actually flatten the curve don't lose these gains. Um, and so we need to uh, constructively and proactively reopen in what I think is a judicious fashion. So that means not big bang, um, but going after and starting at the industries that can still socially distance. Um, to actually think about which people um, can go back to work safely and which ones are at high risk. Um, and so that's where I think the infectious disease community, the healthcare community, and our government officials can partner together to safely reopen. Dr. Stephen Perotti with Kaiser Permanente, grateful you could join us. Thank you so much.